So welcome to another Ask Me Anything Live. Today is, what is today? August 24th. <laughs> How can I help you guys? Yay, Mustafa. Open up chat um, or just unmute if you've got a question. Really happy to help. Hi, Heather. How are you doing, Mustafa? I'm good. How are you? Good. Happy Monday. Yeah, you too. How are things? You know, good, crazy. My kiddos are upstairs fending for themselves. Daddy's on his way home, so we'll see how long this lasts. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, how are you doing? Fantastic, good. Good, I see Nancy, I see Dr. Catherine, our Joyce, hello, welcome you guys. How can I help you? Mustafa, do you have a question? I do. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to paint a scenario and I'd love your feedback on it. Okay. Uh, so it's about copyright. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say that I came to you two or three years ago and I wanted to teach a piece of content that you teach. Mm -hmm. And I called you and say, Heather, I want to teach what you teach. I just wanted to let you know that I want to teach this. Do I have your blessing to teach this? And you mm -hmm. said, yes, go ahead and teach it. As long as you mention my name, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And then two or three years later, you call me back and say, oh, by the way, I have changed things around. Don't teach it anymore. Mm. It is copyrighted now. What is the deal with that? Because you've told me, yes, go ahead and teach it. Now it's part of my mm -hmm. program. Now you're saying, oh, you know, it's copyrighted material. Now you have to either pay me or don't teach it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do I need to do? Yeah, so there's two issues going on here. One is like a verbal contract, right? The other is straight copyright issues. So copyright, when you create something, right, the copyright rests in the individual, which means that you don't have to get a registration to own copyright in your work. As soon as you create something in the world, you are presumed to be the owner of that work. Now, the question then becomes like, once you give permission, can you revoke it, right? And so you'd have to go back to that conversation and say, well, what were the terms of that oral contract? Contracts generally have a time frame. They've got like you flush out the details and often what happens in oral agreements is that those details are not fully fleshed out. Right. Right. So, um, so there is no clear path for this. I mean, if it were to end up in court, it could go a variety of ways. Um, you know, my question for you would be, the thing that you're teaching, particularly if it's like a system, a framework, because nobody can exclude you from teaching on a topic generally, right? So yeah. like, let's say marketing, you're an expert in, right? Yeah. Nobody can prevent you from teaching on marketing. But that said, if you are teaching something that belongs to somebody else, you have to be very, very careful. So for, as an example, um, I created this program called the Leap Lab, right? Which I've been running since last Monday. Every 6 a.m. I lead 10 women through an hour of training. And, um, and I created a whole notebook. I mean, it's like, and this is just a section of it, but it's like literally pages and pages, all the visuals, the exercises. Like I did not use any other materials when I created these, like literally just poured them out of my head, right? That said, are there things that look like this out in the world? Certainly. So copyright, let's be clear that copyright does not protect an idea. It protects your individual expression of that idea. Okay. So my, my question for you is, is there a way for you to teach whatever this concept is that you want to be teaching, but to do it in your own way? That's the magic right? That's the magic. You can't be prevented from teaching the concept. You can be prevented from doing it in a way that looks like somebody else's work. If it's their seven steps or their whatever, right? And you, like somebody would compare the notes and go, oh, that's so-and-so's system, or I totally recognize that body of work because it's been out in the world for a while, right? That's what you want to avoid. But you know, um, if you can come up with your own special sauce, your own way of doing it, right? 
you can't be prevent, prevented from doing that. Just make sure that you're literally not duplicating somebody else's work. Now I get a lot of questions around like, and this is a funny one. Well, if I change 10% of the language, then I'm good, right? Somehow there is like a falsehood running around the world that if you change 10% of something, it's no longer copyright infringement. Not true, right? The, it's, a, it's a fact, like every situation is unique and it's gonna be a determination based on the facts. But you really, when I, when I talk with people about creating a workshop, a workbook, any, any item of work that they want to teach, incorporate, you know, deliver to their own students or through their own business. I really want you to put like everybody else's work away, make it your own, right? Figure out how, and that can be challenging. If somebody has studied somebody else's work for like 10 years and it's ingrained in you, it can be really challenging to, um, to come up with your own way to do it. But I really encourage you, like be familiar enough with the work that you know you are not duplicating somebody else's expression of their idea or that system and really come up with a way to do it in your own way, in your own words, your own framework, you know, your own order, whatever. Does that make sense? It does. Now, if it's a, say, a research process with a bunch of questions, mm -hmm. right? if we totally revamp the language, Mm -hmm. Not 10%. It's like a total new language. We have a new approach. Yes, some of the stuff are similar, but research is not something that was invented. No. Right. right. If, it, like, if it's totally new language and a new approach and it has our components in it, mm -hmm. does it make it different enough to say, well, this is my stuff? Um, so there's they no. They come back and be like, you know what? You got the idea from me. I need you to shut it down. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, and here's the thing I would say about that is um, there's not a way for me to answer that question, you know, in the context of this type of a call. Ultimately, when you're talking about copyright issues, you're going to be having two pieces of work side by side, right? And you have to think about from the standpoint of a reasonable fact finder, is somebody going to look at, you know, piece of work A and compare it to piece of work B and go, oh, yeah, that looks largely the same or the large, the same framework or the same system or the same process, just a few tweaks in the wording, right? You don't want that. Yeah. Like, you know, and so you I would the say- The process to be different? The process to be different, but you know, what I would say is, cause you've got a lot of knowledge in the world of marketing, like take a breather from those particular questions, you know, whatever the system is that you have been teaching or using and stand back and really like if you were to abandon everything that you've absorbed from other people, right? And just, just be really open to like, how would I teach it if I was left to my own devices? Would okay. I do it in a different order? Would the concept come through in a different way? What language would I use, right? you'll find that it's actually probably different than what you've been taught. Okay. So, um, you know, play around with it. I'm happy to talk further about it. I think for purposes of this call, that's, that's as, maybe as much as I can provide from a standpoint of um, kind of preliminary, you know, feedback yeah. and suggestions. Does that help though? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Good Thank luck. You. I know. Good luck. Copyright's a tricky thing, right? We all yeah. benefit from people who have walked before us. And when we study other people's work, you know, those concepts get lodged. And, um, you know, the, the trick is really being familiar enough with what somebody else has put out there that what we are doing does not look like theirs. Um, now, it is the case that for people who have not studied each other's work, Ideas evolve in the world at the same time that look like each other, right? So that is also true, um, which can make it tricky when somebody looks and goes, oh, that guy did it exactly the way that I did it. You know, he must be stealing my stuff. Not always true, right? But if there is a direct link and somebody has literally been studying somebody else's body of work, there's familiarity with it, they've been inside their courses, etc. That gets a little bit trickier. You have to be very, very cautious that you're not duplicating somebody else's work. For sure. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck. Good to see you. All right. Anybody else with a question? Yes, Dr. Catherine. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Mustafa, I just uh, 
last night so look forward to taking that <laughs> oh good you froze um, so you fro actually dr Catherine, you froze for a second so i f feel like the connection may not be great oh the thing you can do is i know it's a bummer but if you keep freezing you can turn off your video and that might increase the quality of the um okay yeah of the audio is that better that is better can i can you hear, hear you clearly yes okay yep um <laughs> So what, would, how can I help you? I was saying uh, hi to everyone and, and I'm... so um, with uh, actually um, one of the questions that I have is related to what Mustafa was asking and what you were saying, you said you have, you know, put together a course and you've got a workbook, you've done it without, you know, paying attention to anyone else's or studying anyone else's, but what happens if you still have items in there, how can you prevent your prevent any copyright infringements when you're starting to put together a course or a program because i'm starting to do that and um and so i want to like preventively make sure that i don't walk into um a, a hole yeah well it's a good question and um to be honest you can't always prevent somebody from making a claim that you are copying them right people are just a little bit nuts that way um but when the thing that i recommend for anybody that is you know becoming an expert in a certain area studying you know a topic really in depth is um be very clear so for example and all of us live in the information world right we we tend to consume a lot of information maybe you're a note taker there's different ways that we can absorb some of the information that's out there but be really, really clear about where it's coming from. So for example, if you read a book and you put notes down, put in the notes and next to the notes exactly where it came from. What you don't want to have happen is um, like if, you, if you're compiling a workbook or you're creating something and you're working from past notes or sources, even if it's your own, it's really, really easy to basically accidentally plagiarize somebody else's work. If you're reviewing your notes and you think that what you've written is, for example, um, your interpretation of somebody's work, when in fact it's the actual word for word work that that other person created. Does that make sense? So there's different strategies that you can use when you're translating information, when you're transcribing things, when you're putting notes down. But, you know, the the biggest i guess my biggest piece of advice is to know and pay attention to any sources that you use for education and learning because you're going to want to be very cautious that you're not duplicating their systems or their frameworks or their information in the way that they say it inside of your own work okay and if i if i know that okay i've studied this particular book or this doctor's mm -hmm. uh online videos and i am actually referring to them and giving them credit is that going to be okay or not no no so the only time that you can use somebody else's work in in your own work is if you have permission, if you have expressed, you know, generally I prefer it to be written permission because then it's a lot more clear. You have backup if they later make an allegation that you've somehow stolen their work, right? So, um, so that does not get you around a copyright infringement claim just because you've referenced an original source. And particularly, let's be clear though, there are some exceptions um, that are called fair use, but they're quite limited. And when it comes to business, they're very limited. So fair use, there are exceptions to copyright infringement if you, for example, are using something for purposes of education, right? You're not capitalizing on it. You're educating somebody, um, you're, um, you know, or it's a, it's a piece of news, like you're commenting like a news person would on somebody's, you know, written piece or visual art or whatever. You're, it's, you're using it for satire purposes um, or commentary or criticism. Um, but generally, as soon as you do even that kind of stuff in a commercial context related to business, related to, you know, developing, even if you're not directly selling a thing, but you're developing a lead magnet, you're getting people to opt in. Like anytime you start tying that into business, you basically have used that in a commercial way and it gets a lot trickier to claim fair use. 
Okay. And this is, by the way, the reason why I've, I have felt so paralyzed so far in doing any damn thing, mm -hmm. because anytime that I want to start anything, all of these things come up. And honestly, I'm a very preventive person. And so mm -hmm. just don't get a headache of a dude for something that I'm not doing intentionally. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that is actually very debilitating. It's, it's not empowering. Like, I don't know get around that and I know that's not a legal question but um, if anyone <laughs> if anyone ever figures that out because what, what that means is that even like you know when I'm starting right now I spoke with you last week like when, when I'm starting my podcast like what happens if I want to say you know um, and I apologize from a, movie, from a person from a book yeah no I apologize because you're cutting in and out a little bit did I, did I um, there, you know, there I was saying, I was saying even with a podcast, when I'm starting the podcast, mm -hmm. if I want, if I want to refer to someone's quote and actually give the name, is that, is that going to be along the same lines, a problematic thing? Do I need permission to, you um, know, generally, so there, there are some examples where, for example, if you're quoting something from a book or a movie and you're, um, what they tend to look at when it comes to copyright infringement is how much of a piece of work you have used, right? So if it's just a brief excerpt, a brief quote, um, generally the, the risk is going to be much lower for those, right? Now, if you're using that quote and making it the title of your course, you might have a problem right? Gotcha. If you're using it and you're just in the middle of, you know, talking about something and using it as an example. So as an example, on point with this, like I launched a couple months ago, a podcast called Guts, Grit and Great Business, right? Well, it was literally the day before my podcast was going live and I was, um, or maybe I had been live, but I was recording my first solo episode. Anyways, it was right in the same time frame. I was like, oh, I should probably read Angela Duckworth's book on grit. <laughs> She's kind of the <laughs> expert on grit in modern times. And so I read it like on a Sunday before my podcast launch. And then I spoke about it in one of my episodes where I talked specifically about grit, right? And I referenced some of the examples that she shared. I didn't quote it. I didn't read from it. I didn't duplicate her work, but I did share some stories as illustrations, right? So the trick is finding that balance where if you're going to reference something, make sure you're not doing it in a commercial context. Like I consider my podcast, you know, primarily to be an educational tool, right? And um, although it may in a roundabout way eventually lead somebody to my business, like I don't promote my business, I don't advertise my business, right? Um, so just be, be cautious. There's no, the truth is with copyright, it's a little bit hard to answer these questions because there is no bright line rule. Every copyright infringement scenario is a case by case analysis, right? And so you have a judge somewhere in the world looking at this and looking at that and saying, are these things the same or did this person infringe this other person's um, rights, right? So, um, so it's a little bit of a trick. I wish I could give really, really clear rules, but you want to be familiar with fair use. You want to be really, really clear on whether or not you're using something in a commercial capacity. And if you are, uh, you probably want to try to stay away from it. Okay. Um, and, and that actually brings me to another aspect. If I, if I can, um, Take one more question with you. Yep, really quick. And then I see John has a question there um, on ADA compliance. Rob probably has one. Nan has one. So let's, sure. yeah, just mention it really quickly and we'll see if I can handle okay, it. Okay, so um, you had mentioned to me um, uh, that you wanted to refer me to someone for trademarking, but, mm -hmm. but that I need to do some searches, which I've just started doing myself, but I, I don't know if there is any direction that you can give me for trade for the trademark search or the search for the trademarking of a of my podcast name yeah so i mean one of the yeah. basics is you want to search all existing podcasts so go into the different podcast um you know hosting platforms and search anything using um, words that you are using inside of your podcast name right you want to search all over google you want to go to the USPTO.gov, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and search any combination of the words that you're using. So let's say you have three or four words in your title, 
search two or three of them at a time. You want to get to know the landscape of what's there. And if somebody already has a registered mark around that phrase or something that looks really similar, and it's in the same category, meaning the same space of work that you are in, you want to definitely get legal opinion before you use that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great questions. Um, let me address John's really quick. John, if you're on the line, so marketers online are warning about the risk of having a website that is not ADA compliant. They suggest lawsuits are plentiful. The full range of requirements for compliance are daunting and expensive. Um, yeah, so John, I'm in Seattle. You're welcome to put into the chat where you're located if you want to share that. Um, ADA compliance is an up and coming issue. Right now, it only applies to businesses that have, you're in California, have 15 or more employees, right? So for some of the really, really small shops, it's not going to apply currently, at least at a federal level. And there, there may be state regulations. The truth is I can't speak to whether or not there are state regulations that um, require you know, smaller businesses to do anything yet. Uh, my suspicion is is no, mostly because that really, really heavily penalizes, you know, small business owners and solopreneur type shops. But, you know, right now, my understanding is that you have to be of a certain size to um, fall in line with that. And so um, ADA compliance is definitely something to watch for because I suspect regulations are going to change. And, um, but you know, there is a certain amount of investment that would be required to get a website totally compliant. And this is why the other thing that I tell people, especially that are small entrepreneurs that maybe lead smaller teams, less than 15 people is um, anytime you're getting ready to update or upgrade your website, watch for opportunities to build in some of those compliance issues into your site so that you're not reaching a point where if you know if your plan is to grow a business that reaches that size or if the law changes you don't have to suddenly backtrack or you know pause business and get all caught up that you actually have been proactive and for example you have either alternative pages set up with large font or you've got um you've got uh, audio functionality built in with automatic readers on your site for people that might be visually impaired. There's different ways um, that you can begin building in some of that functionality, especially when you're at the point of upgrading your website. So I hope that helps. Um, all right, next question. And feel free to pop in the chat, John, if you, if you need any further clarifications. Rob, yeah, go ahead. Oops, I think you'll have to unmute. Do you want me to unmute you? Let's see. Yeah, there there thank you go. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, doing this. It's a blessing. Oh, I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, I am uh, a consultant trust advisor for a you know, long, long, long time. And um, I have developed a, a I'm in the process of developing a digital course. Mm -hmm. so I consult, of course, all of you know the U.S., but most of my work is done with corporations. Mm -hmm. So that's you know the leaders of a company. Mm -hmm. And um, in developing this uh, digital course, um, my wife, who does uh, all the books for the company, and mm -hmm. done that for 25 years is concerned that we, we might end up being in a position where all of a sudden a, they're going to tax us because someone in Alabama, someone in Florida, someone, you know, they, mm -hmm. they get this online. And um, what, do you, what does one do? Now, I've always said that this is part of my consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, what, whatever I do, whether... If I send them a book, um, it's a part of the course material. I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's never, uh, my, my issues are not in the copyright, but making sure that uh, whatever I do is, um, uh, you know, above, we, we don't ever want to do anything wrong. Yes. But on the other hand, uh, th these are services that we're providing, consulting services. So. Um, what advice would you have as I get closer to having this digital course finished, even though I will be introducing and talking some within the course, but a, a lot of it, they'll be uh, doing it digitally. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, it's, um, this is a really, really important up and coming topic. I'm glad you asked about it because um, truthfully, all of us are going to hopefully going to be facing this issue at some point, meaning that, um, that we're at a level of business where this becomes an issue for us. And what I mean by that is that there are state regulations and they all vary on what, uh, on how digital products are taxed and what constitutes a digital product, right? So some states don't yet tax them. Most do or are starting to. Um, and so it's a good question that your wife has asked. There is usually, um, a nexus requirement to the state, right? And so, and to reach a threshold amount, generally you have to be, for a lot of states, and again, it varies. I can, um, uh, if you wanna drop me an email, Rob, and I'll just pop my email into the chat, I can maybe send you a few resources on this. Um, otherwise, I, if you guys are all in, like if anybody else has questions about this and wants to hear about it as well, I could maybe pop some resources into my Exceptional Entrepreneur we, Alliance. Uh, we're located in uh, good old warm Minnesota. <laughs> nice. Um, well, and the key is if you, but your work is probably national, right? You go across state, state right, lines. Right. And, uh, but, you know, <laughs> It's almost like, thankfully, a lot of it's not in California anymore. Yeah, but, um, yeah, because absolutely. They, they're apparently the, the worst for it. Uh, can today. I ask you really quick, I don't mean to cut you off, but can I ask you what platform you're using for your digital course content? I um, haven't ch uh, chosen a, you know, quote, uh, platform. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to say that at this point. Yeah, depending on, um, you know, the cost of your services, depending. So the reason I ask is that certain, certain of the course platforms actually have functionality built into the payment processing system where they will calculate, um, calculate uh, state taxes, right? Including taxes on digital products. And they'll just build that into the system so that you are collecting the right amounts. You're actually collecting tax and it doesn't come out of your bottom line later. Um, but like Infusionsoft has this functionality built in, I think maybe Kartra does, but there are several that don't, that are causing people some trouble in this domain. And so they're having to figure out options for tracking all of this stuff. Um, the threshold amount, so what you're going to want to be clear on is in whatever state you are offering your services, including digital this digital course or digital products, what the threshold amount is for reporting taxes in that state. And so, um, and I, I think I've got a guide, if I had a few minutes um, uh, by Mustafa to look it up, I could send you the link, but you want to really understand where you're doing business, what the threshold amounts are, because as soon as you hit that threshold amount, you do need to be reporting and um, paying taxes in that state, including for online products. Um, and so uh, it's helpful if you have a platform that automatically collects that tax for you, right? Which is why, what? depending on how much business you're doing, you may invest in one of the platforms that does right off the bat. If you're not quite there yet, like if you're not, you know, like I know many of the states, the threshold amount, which I think is true for Washington state as well is a hundred thousand dollars, right? In any one particular state. Um, but again, I don't know that that is the threshold amount across all states. And I think they all vary a little bit. Um, well, I would, yeah, appreciate anything uh, in, in that vein. Um, and I think that's becoming a bigger deal as, mm -hmm. you know, all these individuals are promoting, put, get a digital course, uh, multiply right. yourself and, and that. And um, that's right. I, I, I um, I think that in some ways they make it seem like it's almost too easy. Like, okay, you put up this course <laughs> and there's, you know, there's many underlying quote uh, investments. Or right. Costs. Yeah. Certainly a lot of the course platforms and even people that teach about launching a course, like they generally are not also teaching on some of the fundamental infrastructure you need for a business. They're not teaching on tax issues, legal issues, right? <laughs> it's just, 
you know, those are all, those are all separated out. And so people um, generally, I mean, depending on how savvy they are, they might plan for some of those issues in advance, or they might be bitten by some of those issues once they're out in the world doing business. And that is kind of the trick of the online space. Um, but I can send you a couple links like um, regarding, because there are some, there are also some big service providers that work essentially on the bookkeeping and accounting side that will help somebody like your wife track this stuff and report it correctly. And they generally have a variety of guides and reports and stuff that they've written that are available online that talk about these threshold amounts by state, the taxability of digital products by state, what constitutes a digital product by state, right? So you just want to get familiar with that based on the work that you're doing and where you provide your work. And would that also hold true for just, you know, being uh, consulting, like, you're talking and giving advice and you know you services are generally yeah services are generally in most states not taxed like professional services but again um you know there could be some variations on that so for example in washington state legal services are not taxed right so um you generally want to start obviously with home base look at the rules that apply to where you are located and then start branching out and researching some of the other states where you do like a fair amount of business and just start getting to know the landscape but um, in most cases um, professional services generally are not subject to sales tax like right. i said that's they're, true here that's yeah and, yep. and in most places, that's true. Yep. But products, digital courses, and in most states, those are now being considered a product, so rather than a service. So yeah, people do have to be aware of that, and particularly depending on their level of business. Good. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Good to connect with you, Rob. All right. Any other questions? Yep. Nan? Hi, Heather, can you hear me? I can. Look at your lovely setting. I see nature. Yes, it's our back porch. Nice. Um, I work out here in the summer. I just got your website protection package and I just finished watching the entire webinar. I just got a couple of questions from that. Totally. Related to the copyright thing, mm -hmm. um, I'm an interior designer. Eventually, I would love to be able to use photographs mm -hmm. for education. So I can say, hey, look how they used this. Look how what they did with that to point things out. Yep. And I have seen tons of photographs on, say, apartment therapy, uh, the spruce. Mm -hmm. In all of their blog articles, they have tons of pictures. And then it will say, like, picture via Pinterest. Mm -hmm. That seems a little iffy to me. <laughs> it is iffy. Unless they have express written per permission, it's totally iffy from a copyright perspective. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go ask Pinterest. I would go try to find the photographer. Yeah. And see, exactly. Seek, seek permission directly. You know, you can look and see, are there, um, image data banks that have images of, you know, staged homes or whatever, you could also reach out to people directly in your network, right? If you want to do like real life examples of, you know, before and afters or your own client work, if you have photographed some of that. So, um, you know, there's other ways that you can round up photos, but definitely have permission. Um, and, you know, the other, <laughs> the other thing you can do is find photographers who do home staging photography, like real estate photography, right? Because you could reach out to somebody and get a license to use like a whole batch of images if you like their work. Um, so there's different ways you can run searches on that, but absolutely don't do it. Don't use anybody else's images without permission. Okay. So what yeah. they're doing is not really legal. Not right? unless like they have, the, yeah. The spruce or... Right. If they're saying via Pinterest... Okay. Right. They're like, they're winging it and they're hanging themselves out there because a copyright infringement claim can be a very, very expensive endeavor. Okay. Yep. May I ask one more quick question? Totally. I missed the chat, so I'm not sure if that's available, but I didn't see how we're supposed to type out our email that has the non-spam bot format. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it. Here, let me pop it right into the chat here for you. Mm -hmm. So for example, the way that it shows up in my documents is like this, because you want to avoid the web crawlers that snag yeah. 
um, snag an email and then start spamming you. So this is how I plug mine in to my documentation at the bottom of my site, info at legalwebsitewarrior.com. A human will read that and go, oh, I know what that email is. A bot will skip that. I love that. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Yes, yeah, so you can just grab that as a copy and then just put your own information in there. Wonderful. And I've got a couple more questions, but totally. can I shoot you an email? Yeah, please? absolutely. You can email me right there at that email address. You can also um, pop into the Exceptional Entrepreneur Alliance Facebook group and put some okay. questions there. So either way. Great. Thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. You're welcome, Nan. Great to connect with you again. Hi, Malika. I also see, and I'm, let's see, not seeing names on everybody's screens. John's still with us, Kathy, Carla. Malika, do you have a question? Yes, I do have a couple of questions. Okay. First of all, thank you for doing this. Um, I get to know about you from the Geology giveaway. Oh, so good. I'm still going to your course. Yeah, so this is my first time getting to know you. Excellent. Um, well, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so my question is for a friend. And, and so, so what she's trying to ask is that, can she start an online coaching business from her apartment? Um, so her lease agreement doesn't say anything otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the first question. And, and as a new week coach, what are the legal agreements that are suggested for a group coaching? For group coaching? Yeah. And, and if she repurposes, repurposes the recordings of group coaching, does the media release agreements are mandatory? Yeah, exactly. great question. Totally. Great question. So um, regarding the first question, as far as like where she's at running her business, um, you know, generally I would say yes, it, assuming she's not like hosting clients face to face, right? So she wouldn't be having a whole group of people traipse in and out, <laughs> even at, you know, one at a time. So if you're not doing face to face work, right, she should have a problem creating um, a coaching business and having it be an online, you know, location, really independent business. Um, that said, again, depending on where she lives, depending on even the nature of like zoning ordinances, most online businesses are not going to have a problem. But if you, because there are also local regulations about where businesses can be located, right? And so, um, she's going to, you know, regardless of where you're at in the world, you have to always be aware of local regulations in case, for example, any business activity is excluded in residential neighborhoods, for example. But assuming that she's not having actual business activity, meaning people coming and going, massive deliveries, manufacturing, type, like, you know, no. stuff that would be problematic, yeah. she probably is fine. There are a ton of people with online businesses that work just out of their home, um, now, this isn't to say that she shouldn't investigate insurance, for example, because if you are running a home-based based business, you still probably have office equipment, you've got computers, you might have documents, you have other things that may be worth protecting against um, hazards, right? So it's, it's generally like hazard insurance, but you want to make sure that it covers a home-based business because while it may cover some of the typical things that would show up inside of a renter's home, um, you have to have insurance that specifically covers business activities and most homeowners policies that are typical homeowners policies do not. So she's going to want to look at insurance separately. And my recommendation is that she just contact whoever, I mean, if she's already got renter's insurance, contact the same provider, see if they can either provide a separate policy or a writer for her existing policy that will cover business activities at home, including equipment or whatever else needs to be protected. Um, so that's one thing to consider. And then, um, you know, again, the local regulation thing, but for most people, that's not a problem. Um, for your second question around group coaching, there is a lot to consider with group coaching. You should absolutely have an, a, a, an agreement in place, right? And there's a lot that needs to be covered in, in that agreement. I can, um, Yes. And Rob, I will, um, if you'll email me just cause I want to make sure that I can move on to other, um, other questions. If you'll email me, I'll follow up with like a whole slew of links for you that you can uh, begin investigating on that topic. And John, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Um, oh, thank you, Rob. I'll make sure that I save the chat so that I can just email you. 
Um, so on the group coaching, Malika, and I, I can provide, cause I also have templates on this. I've got a coaching contract that people can use for individual coaching. They can also use it for group po programs, um, depending on how she's selling people into the program. So some people in their coaching, um, enrollment process, they might be spending time on the phone. It might be a very high touch experience where they want to be able to email over a contract, have somebody actually physically sign it, return it. You can do that through DocuSign, hello sign. You can do that even having people print it off and scan it back. Like there's various ways people will have somebody actually sign a contract. Um, you can also do what's called terms of purchase, where if it's an online sales funnel into the group program, like we've all seen the check the box, like I have read and agree to the terms of purchase, right? For iTunes or whatever. You can do that level of functionality. Um, and I have a document that's called terms of purchase that's part of my website protection package. It's a really great way to automate the sales experience if you care about efficiency, you care about minimizing hurdles like barriers to entry for people signing up for your program, but it's not a fit for everyone. Not everybody wants high numbers in their group program. They care more about high touch and they want to make sure that they vet the right people. So if your sales process, your enrollment process looks more like that, where you're like, you know what, I'm not letting anybody into my program until I talk to them and I personally vet them and make sure they're a fit then probably you're going to want to have a higher touch contract experience where you're going to send them a group coaching contract through HelloSign, through DocuSign, actually get their electronic signature, track that before they enter the group. Um, and in that case, you know, I've, and I've got templates for both versions of that, but inside of that document, if, even if she doesn't use my templates, there's some important things that you need to cover in the context of group work. And that is there's, there's liability in a group, right? You don't get to control what other people say, what they do, whether they offend each other, whether they post, you know, a, a comment that, that causes a problem for somebody else. And so um, the, the recommendation that I have as far as some main points to make sure that you cover are that one, you absolutely reserve the right to remove people from the group if they're not a fit, right? And there's certain language that you can put in place for that, but a reservation of rights around removing somebody from the group and limiting your liability to the amount paid to join. For example, this doesn't mean that you automatically provide a refund. So if somebody's being a stinker and they're mouthing off and they're being rude, right? You want to be able to remove them doesn't mean that you automatically have to give all their money back, although that might be the right decision for your business, right? You want to reserve the right to remove them and have the limit of liability be the amount paid, but also you want to have rules around communication, how people communicate with each other, right? So standards around that so that if somebody violates that, boom, they're out, right? There are other rules that you might want to consider. So for example, if you are doing online work with a group, like they all join via Zoom or you have them all in a Facebook group together, right? And they can comment and communicate that way. And they can also have access to other people's data, names, contact information, et cetera. One of the problems in group work nowadays is you have people get inside of groups and then scrape other people's data, meaning like collect everybody's name and contact information and go invite them to go join some other event or here, join my group about this topic. And that usually happens like the higher up the ranks people get in their programs. Um, but it takes a lot of effort to get buns in seats, to get people inside of a group doing a specific kind of work. And so for other people to jump in and try to capitalize on that is unfortunate. So I have also a data scraping prohibition, a clause that prevents people from doing that. And if they do do that, again, they get removed from the group, right? So there's certain things that you just have to think about that come with like risks that come with doing group work. These are the kind of things that you would need to address in the group coaching contract, along with all of the standard provisions about limitations of liability. When we run groups, we know how we intend for people to use our information, but ultimately we don't get to control how they do use it. That's where risk comes in the door for us. So we need to have certain disclaimers in place about the work that we're doing. We need to have limitations of liability in place. So there's a lot more that gets covered in that document, but those are some of the highlights. And then of course you wanna describe 
the work itself. You want to hopefully have a, um, you know, some place that addresses payment terms, all of that. Um, there's a lot that gets covered, but I want to make sure that, you know, we highlighted a few of those because those can be unique risks to group work. You're welcome, Rob. Great to see you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Any other questions? Yeah, and, and that's, that's great. So, and, and about the recording. So mm -hmm. we need to have, if I want to repurpose the recordings, um, how does yeah. that go? Great question. You absolutely should have a media release provision in your coaching contract that says, look, you know, if you show up and participate in the group work, we will be recording it, whether photographically via video or audio recordings. Excuse me while I turn this phone off. And, um, and that people give their permission to not only be recorded, but to have those recordings shared and, you know, used in other ways. And so you definitely want an adequate media release that addresses that. Um, I'm just going to share with you, Malika, the link to my website that has my templates. So I've got both an individual um, template page as well as my bundles. I'm going to share the individual templates only because this will give you a really good idea about the kinds of templates and documents that are available. But Truthfully, the most values inside the bundles, that's where you get a whole bunch of these templates all at once. They protect certain, you know, portions of your business and certain bodies of work, depending on what you're doing. But there's a link right there that I just popped into the chat for the individual templates. And you'll see, like, there's my standard client services agreement for coaches and consultants, right? There's also a consulting agreement for consultants that work with corporations, right? So it depends what kind of individual coaching or consulting you're doing. The reason that, um, you know, there people generally call themselves different things. Some people like the word coach, some people don't, and they call themselves a consultant, even though what they're doing is working with individuals. Um, generally, when I reference consultants, they are working with organizations or corporations, right? But if you have any questions, like if you go look at my site or your friend does, yeah. obviously you can jump into my contact form or just email sure. me. Sure. Um, just, just one last question. So let's yeah. just say that I'm doing a Zoom workshop. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, it's like that. And I have a, and it's a free workshop just like this. And I, I have an intention to repurpose that for maybe a bonus in my paid program. Mm -hmm. So even in those situations, do I need to have a media release agreement? Because I, because honestly, I have not signed up any release agreement for um, any workshops. Or, and, right. I, and I always think, uh, you know, why are they not making me sign anything? Because otherwise, you know, uh, I don't know where these recordings are being used, I'll be honest. But because That's I'm right. That. Yes. Um, so, so how do I go about it? Yeah, no, great, great question. So um, there are ways that when you, so for one, you can turn on the registration requirement through Zoom. So if you're just doing yeah. a free class through Zoom, right? And let's be clear that, that delivering either information or work or value for free does not mean free of liability. I really want people to understand that just because you're doing something for free, just like publishing information on the internet through your website, does not mean that it's free of liability. People can still rely on that information. They can still make choices in their life that, that is based on that information and it can cause them harm or bring risk into their life, depending on what the information is, right? So, um, so yes, you are much better protected if you have got terms in place, including just on your website. And depending on where people are opting into the Zoom call, like let's say you have an, a landing page, you can have terms right on the page that say, look, a condition of participating in this free workshop is, you know, ABC, XYZ, and put it right on the page. You can also have terms of purchase right under the registration link right? That maybe takes them to the Zoom link where they have to register. So there's different ways that you can set it up. The other thing you can do just um, as a really minimalist way of doing this, like let's say you don't have a landing page set up, but you've got the Zoom, the Zoom uh, meeting scheduled. You turn on the registration function. What it means usually is people have to sh sign up, give you their email address, right? To be able to be let in. Well, then you can go issue a report. You can go you know, once you have all the registrations, let's say that they have to sign up at least 24 hours in advance of the, of the event, download a report of all of their registrations and send them a confirmation email that says, hey, great, I see that you've registered for the workshop tomorrow and just put right into the body of the email 
please note that this event will be recorded, right? And a condition of participating is that you are, you know, agreeing that it will be recorded. They can obviously turn off their camera. So that's one thing that you could say at the beginning of the workshop, right? Turn off the camera if you don't want to be recorded, but you still want to participate. Like, just be very open about it, right? And so it's like at the beginning of this call, and I know people jump in late, but I said, okay, I'm turning on the recording, you know, and then I let people know, like, we're starting. So just do what you can. It's not going to be perfect, but do what you can to, to provide notice where you can. And even if you don't have a totally perfect sign up registration form right now, you can give them advance notice in an email that just says, look, it's going to be recorded. This is a free workshop, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Put some basic terms in. Um, but that way you at least give people the chance to have notice rather than not providing any notice at all. Okay, that's 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 a relief, and I can always say that it may be used for marketing purposes. So yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Yep. And, and, yeah. Sorry. No, that's all right. Let's let's see if anybody else has questions, and you can also pop one into the chat if you've got additional questions. I just want to make yeah. sure that we cover everybody. These are great right, questions. You. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, so James, do you have a question? You're welcome to unmute or Kathy. Go ahead, James, if you're ready. Um, okay, can you hear me? I can. I'm going to turn you up a little bit. I had a really strange situation come up with an email from a client uh, uh, that I have in South Texas. Hmm. Uh, he and his wife are both li licensed pharmacists in South Texas. Got he it. A daughter that lives in Manhattan, New York City, who is going to be, she's licensed in the state of Texas as a pharmacist. Hmm. And she's going to be doing contract work to Texas organizations from Manhattan. So it's a multi-jurisdictional thing and I'm, I'm wondering how do we deal with that legally? Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have to look at New York and see what her legal requirements there. Does she has to be licensed in New York as a pharmacist to be able even to work remotely? I don't know. Yeah, and it, it, as if the, the remote work, legal requirements are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. No. And just so I'm clear, did you say that you have a daughter based in Manhattan that will no, be no, doing it's their daughter? Oh, their daughter based in Manhattan. Right. And they're in Texas. Right. And is she, is she licensed anywhere? She's licensed in Texas. In Texas. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so if she's licensed in Texas, the fact that she's based in Manhattan, assuming, I assume it's remote, like either online or, sure. and do you know the nature of what the services are that she's going to be providing? Uh, she's just, I guess, going to be a contract pharmacist. That's as much as I've gotten so far. Oh, got it. So it's just like online showing up and talking with people who also live in Texas about right. prescriptions or, yeah. Um, so my guess, and again, I'm not licensed in every state in the United States, so right. this is a guess, but my guess is that that's probably fine. So long as it's, it's where the work is delivered, right? So long as she's consulting with probably people based in Texas, because that's Correct. where she's licensed versus like anybody around the United States. Right. So, um, that said, they have changed some of the telemedicine you know, rules currently because of COVID. And so mm -hmm. you're right that absolutely the place to start as far as understanding and for any licensed professional, it really doesn't right. matter what, what line of work you're in. You need to understand the rules that apply to your profession and where you're licensed. So she absolutely should start with state regulations based in Texas that apply to the pharmaceutical industry. Right. And then, um, if she's doing any of that work in New York, she'd obviously need to be understanding the rules. But my sense is that like, it's not local to New York. She could be in France and be doing this, right? Correct. Yeah. And so I suspect that that actually is irrelevant, but it's up to her to confirm that by understanding the licensing regulations that apply to her licensure in Texas. And she may have, most licensed professionals have like a compliance board that they can go ask questions sure. to involving ethics or any other issues. She might just run a pre preliminary question past somebody if it's not answered in the rules themselves. Okay. Otherwise, she could consult with an attorney based in Texas that knows pharmaceutical regulations. 
that mm -hmm. that would be where I would start if she continues to have questions after doing some research herself. Um, okay. James, what's your work? I am a uh, accountant. I'm oh, actually okay. going to be starting another business in uh, about two or three months from scratch. It's going to be web based. I ran across a uh, webinar you did a week or two ago. Oh, nice. Wrote, wrote your name down. I'm like, I, I know I'm going to need that. Mm -hmm. And then your email popped up this morning or yesterday. And I'm like, I'm going to log in and watch that just to awesome. see if I get a chance. Uh, it, would it be okay if I forward your information to some other people that I know that want to start online businesses? Totally. It's, it's what it's the folks that I help are all in the online space, usually in okay. some way. So absolutely. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Great to connect no, with you, you, James. Yes. Good luck and good luck to your clients. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Kathy, do you have a question for me today? And you're welcome to unmute, or if you're not in a place where you can do that, you also can pop into the chat. And I know some people just jump in to listen and benefit from others. There you go. You're here with have, us. I don't have a specific question, but mm -hmm. I'm getting lots of really valuable answers to questions I have had. So thank oh, you good. so much. You're so welcome. Well, I love, you know, I love these group question periods because of that. People tend to benefit so much from other people's questions that they either hadn't asked or hadn't thought to ask or find like actually have overlap with their own business. So I'm grateful for that feedback. This is great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Kathy, what do you do? I actually am a professional dog trainer. Oh, fabulous. But because of COVID, obviously, mm -hmm. my business has gone downhill quite a bit. So now I'm looking at trying to figure out how to do something more online or virtual. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, it's really curious. I got contacted. So I just launched the podcast a few months ago and it's been a really fun experience. I got contacted by a mutual friend who knows a woman who previously taught swimming lessons, right? She has successfully transitioned her swimming coaching online. I have no idea like how one does that, but she, she may be a guest on my podcast. So stay tuned because I think that would be a fascinating question for, or, or conversation for anybody struggling to take their business online. Like in my mind, like somebody who teaches swimming lessons can do it, right? Yeah. It can eliminate some of the barriers for the rest of us. So oh, um, absolutely. That'd yeah, be great. if you're on my list, watch for that. But it's, um, I need to reach back out to her because I think that would actually be a really good conversation. Oh, I would. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I feel uh, so, so fortunate thinking about that. I'm not that person who has swimming lessons because now I can do anything knowing that she has done already. Right. <laughs> Right. No, I heard that. And I was like, wow. And apparently she's done it very successfully. So um, yeah, it can be done. The really the name of the game right now is creativity. And, yeah. you know, really getting into the mind of clients and, and figuring out like, what is a way not, not whether or not I can, but what is a way that I could right go online? Because yeah, we all need to be there. All right. Great questions, you guys. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. On Heather, um, in the um, terms and conditions, I think it is, you say that we need to just describe very plainly every single package that we're offering online. Yeah, the terms of purchase. Terms of purchase. Mm -hmm. So do we also need to list descriptions of our in-person services? Um, depends how you're selling those right? So if you have online sales funnels into your in-person services, yes, you should probably include them there. You know, that said, depending on what those are, like if your in-person services are like home staging or design, that's probably better covered by a traditional client services agreement, like right? Uh, yeah, a regular contract that somebody signs, like a one-on-one -on -one client. The online terms of purchase is generally really well suited to online offerings that are also delivered online, right? right? So that's really like what is mostly intended to be covered by those terms of purchase. So it's really about your online business, what's sold online and delivered online. The um, Most people usually still have some element of one-on-one -on -one client services or group work that has a different sales funnel and really requires more of a standard client services agreement. Yes, I have one of those for in-person. I just didn't know if I need to list them as well. So I don't- Not necessarily. Nope, not if you're not doing an online sales funnel into that work. Okay, wonderful. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Great question. 
Yes, Malika. I just checked the individual templates on the bundle. That's that's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. It's yeah, gonna really so help me out. Um, oh, good. Um, I am I'm an intellectual property professional by profession. Oh, I'm into patent licensing, so copyright yeah. and trademarks was really my reading thing. I never did, you know, it was more about patenting. Yes. So I still have any question about copyrights and trademarks so thank you for sharing that yeah um, you're so welcome uh, so regarding just just a quick question so regarding the leasing agreement which you shared about the apartment thing uh so she doesn't have to reach out to the uh apartment people right it's okay if the agreement doesn't say anything the leasing agreement doesn't say anything about the online business or yes no generally i mean i think i would like i said absent her bringing people directly into the apartment related to the business which i think is probably not the case it's not, there, sh yeah. there should not be any problem with her setting up an online business there okay and 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 the address so when when you use these email campaigns like convert kit and all those email softwares because they mm -hmm. ask email address and yes. they have asked the residential address uh, you can you can already sense that i'm into all of this because the questions i'm having is yes. um so the address she has to use is um because convert kit offers their own address mm -hmm. convert kit they, they have their own seattle based address but other uh softwares don't yeah so can she use her apartment residential address as the business address or she, yeah, yeah, she can. Um, so you're right that on the bottom of any of the CRM, like email softwares that you use to communicate with your list, you're required by law to provide a mailing address where you receive mail. Does not have to be your home address. So for example, I don't want people to know my home address. So I have a PO box, right? Because I've had some kind of weird things happen online. I have a PO box that's not very far from here that all my business mail goes to. So I list that PO box down in the footer of that email so that I don't have to worry about somebody seeing that and being like, oh, I could drive to her house. You know, <laughs> not that most people would do that, but some people would. So, um, you know, my recommendation, especially for women online, is don't use your personal residential address if you can avoid it. Rent a PO box. Um, set up maybe a registered agent address. You can pay somebody, you know, the registered agent services like 49 bucks a year. And some of them also provide the receipt of mail, which means that um, they usually have some digital process for receiving your mail, scanning it to you and dropping it into your, they usually have an interface or an email system that will notify you when you receive mail. I'd highly recommend that um, for anybody in the online space, but particularly women, they go that route. Just it's just better, safer, it's better. And then you have a separate business address. Okay. Okay. That's, that's awesome. Because that, that's exactly what I was thinking. Just to get the PO suggests her that, but totally. if she uses her residential address as a starting, like as a newbie coach for a while, is that legally okay? Totally, totally okay. fine. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. The, the only question around that, and again, this gets down to local licensing laws is, you know, if she is starting a business, she's going to want to make sure that she complies with state and local laws. And in some counties and cities, you're required to register a business, which means that it's on file with local authorities so that they know how to tax you and how to track your income and all of that. So even, know, if, even if it's sole pro proprietorship or is it more like LLC? That's right. No, even for a sole proprietorship. So generally, if you are starting a business, you're required and certain cities and counties or states have certain thresholds. So for example, if you make less than like $12,000 a year, you may not be required to pay the full business license fee. Like they'll cut it in half. I know that here locally, that's what they do. Like you pay a lesser amount if you're not making that much money. But even then, you know, for a, a, an annual license for a business here, not very expensive. It's like $59 a year for the business license itself. They might have recently raised it. But you want to make sure that, you know, your friend or you or whoever, you understand what your local state laws are around business formation and business activities generally, because you may be, especially if you're reporting a business address somewhere that, you know, can be tracked to you, you may also, you know, even as a sole proprietor, want to set up a business license for that business. Do, do I have to, can I Google it and figure that out? Or, generally, or yeah, generally okay. you can. So you want to first look at, start at state level, because sometimes you're required to get what's called a master business license at the state level. And that, this really is just a way for the state government and, and federal government to track your particular business, right? As And some people 
like depending on if you are uh, acting as a sole proprietor in your individual name, like you don't have to register a DBA or what's called a fictitious trade name um, around your individual name. But like if, if, you know, Bob Jones created a plumbing business and he wanted to call it green plumbing, he'd need to register that DBA so that the state and the city, the local authorities can track his business activities related to green plumbing since it's not in his name. Right. So there are, even as a sole proprietor, there usually are requirements around reporting whether or not you've got a fictitious or a trade name, sometimes called a DBA. Also, if you need a registered business license for that particular activity, um, you just want to make sure that you don't skip that stuff because painfully that can catch up to people and then you can owe like 10 years of local taxes for business activity that you didn't report. Just figure out the county and like the county and registered business license. What's like, is there a requirement for my county? Yes, you want to look at it at three levels state, county, okay. and city right? Some counties don't have business requirements. Some cities don't. It really depends on the location. Yes. Um, but you want to start first with state. So wherever, whatever state you're in, Google, you know, state business requirements, um, and then county, Google that, and then um, city. And just make sure that if you have business licenses required at each level, that you get them. Okay. And, and by understanding what you're sharing, that it's not, it's not a big deal. It's like really cheap. So yeah. Yeah, like, like, I want to say that the first year I started setting up, you know, um, business licenses for the city of Seattle inside the city of Seattle for local clients, it was like 20 bucks, right? It's probably a little bit higher now, but it's inexpensive. It's just they want to have the paperwork on file to track your business activity so that they can collect things like B&O taxes and some of the other things that are usually a pretty minimal tax, but really help a city business, like city run its operations, Right. And um, we all benefit from being able to create and run businesses. And so we need to report that stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great questions. Um, I, I see Dr. Catherine's question. Secondary consults to your patients. <clears throat> Can't figure out the correct way to go about it from your licensing perspective. Yes. A little different than swimming. Yes. And Dr. Catherine, especially if you're a licensed professional. So um, secondary consults to dental patients, I am guessing means consults that may or may not be necessarily related to the dental work. So for example, maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's holistic health, right? Uh, no, not, not quite. Um, not quite. I, I, yeah. Um, I mean, as a dentist, I, I do provide uh, when appropriate uh, nutrition consults or nutritional uh, uh, recommendations, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about like literally people who, especially during these times, um, they, uh, they would call me and say, you know, um, I have this thing going on with my tooth or I've been to mm -hmm. a dentist. This is what they recommended, but I want to check with you because like I trust a second you opinion, more. like a second so, opinion. Yeah, right. So like a second, <laughs> second opinion, but, um, obviously, um, it will be limited to information but a lot of times uh, people consult with me, literally. They, they, mm -hmm. they use me as a consultant who knows dentistry that they trust. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, this dentist tells, tells me this. This is how my tooth feels. And this is mm -hmm. the other person's recommendation. And so they're seeking guidance, kind of like yeah. what you're offering us right now. Totally. Right? So you're not, you're not telling me exactly to do this, this, and that because every state and every situation is different, but you're yep. giving us like a guideline and general consult. Yeah. So I've been, I've been, uh, I've been asked a lot of those questions mm -hmm. and a lot of people have been suggesting that I provide this as a, as an official service mm. so that I can charge for it. Yep. Understood. Okay. And I assume yeah. you'd be doing this across state lines. Would that be your goal that anybody anywhere could contact you about this stuff or would it just be for folks within your state? I would, I would want to be careful and just stay within Virginia, which is okay. where, I, where I'm licensed just to be protected better. Yeah. So the question I would have for you is one, are these in-person consults or are they remote? Like, are they? Uh, at this point they would be remote, but I can mm -hmm. do telemedicine to some extent. And, and I have some uh, I mean, if, if people, let's say, want to share their radiographs and their test results with me, I can refer to them. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, the questions that I've been asked are, are 
general in the sense that, you know, this is my history with this mm -hmm. tooth and this situation, and I want to know which direction to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, should I do the implant or shouldn't I do the implant kind of thing? Like, what yeah. are my other options? A lot of them are generalized questions that I can yeah. answer uh, as to, like, let's say as a friend. Yeah. Um, but I'm noticing that people are asking me during this whole COVID time more and more specific questions. And I'm hesitating to answer because I can't answer them until I have all the data that I can look at. Right. Appropriate. Right? Or, or, or that I have them officially be my client, my patient. Yes, that's right. So that I can then cover well, myself. Yes. And your hesitation is appropriate, right? So, so two things for you. One, you want to be really clear. Are you doing this in the context of your dental practice? Like, is this you know, medical services, just like you would provide in your dental practice. And if you're doing that route, you want to be really clear on what the rules around telemedicine are for your, for your profession, right? So you'd go back to the, back to the rules, back to the licensing rules around what kinds of things can you do via telemedicine? So for example, like last week I had to call our pediatrician because my daughter was having what we thought was a sty developing on her inner eye and it was causing her some problems. And of course, doctors probably can't diagnose and work through telemedicine for things that they either, you know, can't see or can't understand very well. Right. So, right, being really clear on what the rules are around telemedicine as it applies to dentistry in your state is the first place to start, right? The second... Where would I even look for that? Because telemedicine and dentistry has not really been a thing. Um, yeah. Is, so is this kind of now up and coming? I would start by contacting your your state board of dentistry, whatever right. it's called, and ask them specifically for any rules that apply around telemedicine, right? Okay. So these may be evolving, but a lot of licensed professionals are reaching out right now and getting preliminary opinions from their licensing board okay. so that they don't misstep. So I'd start there and just see what information you can learn. And then okay. secondly, if you decide to run it as an education business, a little bit like what I'm doing here, right? So you'll notice that I do this in the context of a group. It's educational. It's not like I can't provide state specific advice, which is why I constantly remind people, if you need something specific to a particular state, you need to consult with an attorney there, right? This isn't legal advice, it's education. Um, so you wanna be really careful because for most licensed professionals, if they're branching into the online world and they're going to cross state lines, you have to first figure out if you can do that. So for example, you and I talked about nutrition coaching, right? People who call yeah. themselves a health coach and give advice on the topic of nutrition, really can't do that in certain states and they get themselves into trouble um, constantly by doing that without even knowing that there are rules that apply to that particular field. So you want to be really clear what you're doing, what state you're going to be operating in. And then from there, like it may be worth setting up a second business that is not that you're not running as a licensed professional, even though you're going to bring your dental background to that work, right? It's more of information education business done in the context of not providing one-on-one -on -one specific medical advice, right? So that's a little bit tricky because people show up with questions that sometimes venture into that area, but um, there are ways to educate people around common issues that you see in dentistry common pitfalls, common things that a lot of people experience where um, you can be comfortable that you that your education and information will help them without risking having it be perceived as individual medical advice, right? So the, the caveat is always going to be that, um, you know, this education might help them reach a decision, but they should always be making any decision in conjunction with a dentist who mm -hmm. is actually looking inside okay. their mouth or doing all the blood tests or whatever it is that they need to do. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. You're welcome. Sounds all like, right. sounds like I'm going to be reaching out to you for that second business. Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> most licensed professionals, I really tell them, you know, everything that you do in the online space and the education world, you need to look at from the perspective of if I was sitting in front of a licensing board, what would I have to say about this? Is it on my professional license side? Is it separate and apart from that? And it's in my information or education business, right? You have to be really clear that you do different things 
in both of those businesses, treat them separately. You know, the, the work that you do as a licensed professional is very distinct and apart from the work that you do over here, educating people. But they kind of overlap in the sense that because I'm a licensed dentist, I have the yes, information. Yes, you have the knowledge. That's right. They, they absolutely yeah. do overlap. You bring your history and your professional skill set to bear on that education. Absolutely. But I understand what you're saying. If someone, if I'm, if I'm educating somebody and literally I say to somebody, okay, go and extract that tooth, whereas they could have maybe saved it, um, that, that's, that's where you're you know, the, the, yes. the standard of care issue comes in. Totally. And you have to yeah. understand, like, you know, you have to be able to describe, like people have options, right? Option A is this, option B is this. Generally across the population, risks with option A look like this, risks with option B look like this, yeah. right? You're not telling them to go do a particular thing. Right. And actually that has, that is pretty much how I have been answering mm -hmm. those questions with friends and, you know, mm -hmm. people, uh, and, and a lot of, a lot of my, like, you know, texts, uh, if I go back to them, when I'm talking to a friend, it, it says, what did your dentist tell you? Yes. What did he do for you? Like, you know, go back to them. Like, you yes. know, but, so well, I but find myself repeating that all the time. That's right. And you know, these are the types of questions to ask your dentist, right? So there's a lot of information that you can provide around coaching them to be a more informed version of themselves so that they're asking the right questions of their dentist about, you know, certain risks or whatever, right? You, you know, the risks and the pitfalls, but helping somebody become educated on that so that they have better quality conversations with their medical provider results in a higher standard of care for them as well. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Great to connect with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? And Malika, I see a hand up. I don't know if that was from before or you've got another question. No, it, it was from before. I just okay. have a quick question. This one. So is this, is, is it going to be hosted again? This um, Ask Me Anything? Yeah. So I've actually done this every Monday since the beginning of COVID. So I, I launched this as a way to support people with getting their businesses online and tackling legal stuff in COVID because it's been so hard on so many people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so you're welcome. This is my first time and I'm already feeling so relieved. And I've also sent a request in your Facebook group. Oh, good. Um, so yeah, I will be, you know, following you everywhere. So I will eventually become your customer. <laughs> That's okay. No, I'm so happy to support people in this yeah. way because the, the trouble with the traditional legal industry is people don't get their questions answered. And so they have a hard time even looking in the box to understand their legal needs. And it's a very high barrier to entry and it, it does not serve people in this space well. So I'm all about educating people first so that then they go, oh, now I know how to take care of my business. I can begin to look at the different areas and really prioritize my own needs because I understand them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thanks yeah, so you're much. welcome. Great to connect yeah, with and you. Yeah, it's so much cheaper to get everything set up correctly up front yes. than to get, ha, have, have something come in behind it and then Hallelujah. you're looking at thousands and thousands of dollars to fix it. Isn't that the truth? It's so oh. awful. And, you know, people are really primarily driven by pain, which is the truth. And so it's unfortunate to, because I don't like to sell pain, right? I don't like to be like, watch out. And I'm not a sky is falling type of person. But I, you know, what I tell people is just like, so the path to business for anybody, like we all truly start business for, for the most of us as technicians, meaning that we mm -hmm. come with a Absolutely. certain, right? A certain skill set. We're here to do a certain thing in the world, but guess what? Along the way, we end up having to learn marketing and sales and business technology and information systems and like all these other things that we didn't necessarily plan on at the start of our business journey. And for small entrepreneurs or small businesses, same is true for legal. You have to be able to understand some of your own legal needs to stay out of trouble, but that tends to be hard information to get correctly in the marketplace. And so for me, I spend a lot of like, it's why I have, you know, downloads and my free legal basics boot camp and other things on my website that will just give people that education so that then they can go, oh, now I have the map. I know what I need. I can start to actually more strategically build my business and save myself, you know, as James said, thousands of dollars of heartache by doing it the right way first. 
But it's it's also worth noting it that I have spent around five thousand dollars on group programs and everything. Mm-hmm. And the, and I was I was in a retrospect was thinking, oh my god, I am already in a profession which is intellectual property, but I still got lost. Yeah. And none of those programs said anything about the legal agreements or about the legal boundaries, which is so essential as an entrepreneur, even though you're right. starting out the very first time. It's such a less glamorized information. Yeah. Everybody's talking about sales and marketing, how do you attract ideal clients and all of that, but nobody talks about how important it is to even find that. So if you are starting a beta course, get the like, you have a name of that course, you first have to mind, you know, you have to mind out that who else is using that same that's name. Right. That's like the question step. that Catherine asked, that's right. That's like the first step and nobody's talking about that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, <laughs> Um, it's bizarre, but it's so important. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you're welcome. The analogy I use is that so many people in the online business space, and part of it is just the nature of the marketplace. You can put up a website and literally be in business overnight, right? And some people do that. And But people spend so much time, I call it like polishing the outside of the car, like they don't build the engine. They don't like, you know, and, and this is just the way these businesses evolve. It's okay. But for those that are really, really serious about what they're, where they're going at some point, they lift the hood and they go like, Oh my gosh, I don't have an engine. I should probably figure that out. And that's when they need people like James to do the accounting and set up systems. And they need people like me to put structural supports in place and like help them really treat their business like a business, right? And the truth is you just don't go to the next level and the next and the next without those supports. So it's, um, yeah, it's really important, but people tend to get really caught up on like, I need to do the website perfect and I need to do this, all all this other stuff. And they end up a ways down the road and still find that it's not working. And at some point you have to backtrack a little bit and put the real supports in place. Yeah, and the reason you do that is because at some point in time, no matter how good you are, no matter how hard you work, somebody will be unhappy and they will probably sue you. Or they'll make your life hellish. Or they'll make your life miserable. That's that's right. Until you just figure out like, oh, I need to plug this gap. And then it's in the process of trying to get that gap plugged that they learn like, oh, I actually have these other legal needs as well, or these other financial or, you know, accounting needs, et cetera. Yep. Yeah. So you kind of do what the dentists are, are taught yeah. to do, right? <laughs> we, we, we tell our patients ahead of time the risks as best as we can, mm-hmm. have them, you know, sign their informed consent and, you know, re-explain it. And then if we make a mistake, own up to it. That's right. That's, that's you know, one of the ways that, that a lot of dentists have, uh, have avoided lawsuits by having that honesty and rapport mm-hmm. with, uh, mm-hmm. with patients. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know there are bad, there are there are those bad ones that are opportunistic, but a lot of the ones that I know who've been sued is because of that lack of honesty or that lack mm. of rapport or their or their arrogance in not acknowledging that there was a mistake made, whether it was their fault or not. And then that that kind of ticks people off, and they're like, you know what, that's not that's not right. Like, that's I'm gonna right. make you suffer for what what I what the suffering I've had done. And basically, that's where the lawsuits begin in in my field, anyway. No, it's true. In the medical field, you're absolutely right. So if you, um, there's a book that I recommend to everybody, especially people in business, it's called Difficult Conversations. It's written by the the people who run Program on Negotiation at Harvard. Harvard. And what, what Dr. Catherine is talking about is um, in the medical world, like bedside manner really matters. And when people are experiencing pain or a problem, acknowledging that and, and it's the same is true in alternative dispute resolution. You end up in a fight with somebody over something that went wrong, either in the delivery of your services or anything else. Acknowledging their frustration is, even though it feels risky, it's actually one of the best things you can do. You don't have to agree with it, but you need to acknowledge it because people never, literally never move off of their position. If they've been harmed or they feel hurt or like something happened until they've been hurt. And it is why that doctors, you know, in the medical world that have the lowest amounts of malpractice lawsuits, they are very good at acknowledging the patient's perspective and point of view. And a lot of doctors inadvertently make the mistake of thinking like, oh, I can't say that. I can't say that I'm sorry that I missed this thing in their chart or that, you know, I didn't put that note down. 
Yeah, because they think that it implicates them, but that is actually exactly what is most likely to move somebody off of the position of suing them, is to have that personal connection and that personal acknowledgement of that pain. But it's an excellent point. Yeah. But that book, Difficult Conversations, like I've probably got like four copies of it in my office. I think I've that. heard of this before. Or it's I really good. Yeah. All the kind of time. It's, it's phenomenal. In fact, I'll just find the link on Amazon so that I link to the right one um, and put pop it into the chat. But it's like $10. It's literally can save people thousands of dollars in life and business. And the, the beautiful part about this book is that it can be used in your personal life. Like, yes, it's absolutely essential in business. Let me just see what edition this is but it can totally be used in your personal life as well. I just want to make sure that I have the most recent version. Um, so it was originally published and I'm just looking at the copyright notice on this page. It was originally published, I think in 2000, maybe even 99. So let me go look. There's several versions online. I always have to find which one is. And the do you also have a reference for like a legal you know, knowledge about legal aspects of online business, like any book which you would recommend, just to intro or... You know, I don't know of any books that pertain... Just to writing one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know I, sh right? I should write one. We'll... <laughs> yeah, exactly. You should write yes. one, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, listen to that. Yeah, so that's apparently my next book. Um, you got your first three purchasers here. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. <laughs> I love it. And the title can be stop looking at your niche. First, figure out your legal, legal stuff. Yep, that's right. Well, I do have a lot of resources that would help you, Malika. So they're not in book format, but I have, um, if you are not already inside of my Legal Basics Bootcamp, I can pop a link into that. That's a free training that would provide you with a lot of, um, a lot of information about how to create the map of what you need. Um, there are some additional, like more specific trainings that I do. I have a master class that I put on for free. I've got, um, and Malika, remind me, how did you get to me? Like, I'm trying to figure uh, out what experience you've had yet with my information. Yeah, I think I, I got it from, I may be in your basics bootcamp because I signed up for the JBology kit. Oh, okay. Got it. So, um, I'm yet to go back and check all the kits, uh, but. Yeah, I would, I would read check again. Okay, so get into the Legal Basics Bootcamp inside of that. And it's just a series of short videos where I, I walk you through what's called my five bucket framework for business protection. And there's five buckets that we look in, right? We start with business entity as the way to separate person basically business liability from personal assets. You have to have a formal business entity. So for example, staying a sole proprietor for very long, it from the court's perspective, from the IRS perspective, your business and your personal life are the same. They live in the same place, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want to, you don't want to do that for very long because that is risky depending on what you do. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a problem. 60% more, or maybe even more than 60% of small businesses in the United States are sole proprietors, right? And what this means is that they're at a disadvantage from the standpoint of liability, asset protection, um, even tax advantages, right? You have better tax advantages available to you to actually grow a business and grow wealth if you create a formal business entity. So that's bucket one. Bucket two is business contracts. This is where I spend a lot of time with people. Most of my clients, we spend a lot of time in the business contracts bucket because this protects the work that you do day in and day out. If you think of your business entity as a foundation, it's literally the foundation to your business, your, the things that you do in your business, the way that you run your business, like all of the ways that you deliver your services, think of that as a, a piece of equipment or machinery sitting on that foundation nuts and bolts and gears and you know all the mechanisms for delivering your services hiring help in your business all of the ways that you grow your business that machinery should be protected by contracts client services agreement group pro group coaching program agreement your website terms and conditions your website privacy policy your website terms of purchase all of these are as an exchange of value what i call an exchange of value in your business, even if you're giving away stuff for free, right? So your question around, I'm gonna do this Zoom training and people will show up. You should have terms in place around that because there is liability. So if you're hiring an independent contractor, another exchange of value. If you're hiring, if you're entering into an affiliate relationship or creating a joint venture, 
another exchange of value. You should have contracts in place for each of those areas to not only protect your intellectual property, protect what you deliver and provide inside of your services and your information, but it also protects the business relationship. You know, for your online sales, it protects your merchant account. It protects you against, you know, friendly fraud. It protects you against a lot of things. And so um, business contracts is a big bucket and that's one of the primary ways you can protect an online business. Um, and then you have your, your insurance bucket, right? So we talked a little bit about insurance earlier. It's like 13 different kinds of business insurance policies available to small businesses in the U.S. So that's an individualized picture, but people need to be considering insurance because that's like padding around the whole piece of machinery and the foundation. Insurance protects against very unique kinds of risks, very specific risks that are unique to your business, um, but it doesn't protect against everything, right? So it's, it's, you can't use one of these protections in lieu of another. They're all layers. Um, and then finally, the fourth bucket is intellectual property protection plan, right? So you know a thing or two about patents. I coach people primarily on trademarks and copyrights because most of the folks that I serve, their needs are more in those buckets. Um, but small businesses generally have a hard time understanding that they have intellectual property needs just like big businesses. And they, they try to opt themselves out of that framework because they think like, oh, it's going to cost me too much, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you've got copyright registrations available to you. Yes, you have trademark registrations available to you, right? Um, and you have contracts. So contracts, which we cover in bucket number two, also help protect your intellectual property. So there's multiple strategies available in the intellectual property protection plan bucket, but people need to be thinking, especially in the online information space, IP, like the information you create is the primary asset in your business. So you have to be thinking about it that way. And then finally, the fifth bucket, you go get this book, Difficult Conversations, that will get you a huge start to covering yourself in the fifth bucket, which is how do you communicate in a way, because the fifth bucket is dispute resolution plan for your business. And really what that means is a communications plan for your business. Think of all the touch points you have with your clients from your marketing language to your sales or your enrollment call to your exposure to your business policies or your online business to um, the enrollment using a legal document, using a contract into your client services. And then the way that you deliver those services and have any customer service support, like all of those are touch points with your clients and you wanna make sure they're consistent and your legal contracts should be one more piece of that puzzle that are consistent. And you should be educating your clients through your marketing language, through your sales and enrollment language, through your business policies, through your contract. Clients don't like surprises, right? Especially negative ones. So <clears throat> your dispute resolution strategy is really about communicating well, <coughs> excuse me, Got a tickle in my throat. And communicating proactively so that you educate your clients <coughs> and they don't inadvertently having, have a negative surprise. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So uh, just, a, just a quick, quick question. <coughs> uh, quick something which happened with me, you know, uh, just a few, few weeks back was that I had this client which was like amazing, awesome, a super fan and everything. And she started working with a therapist during COVID. And she came to me along as she was working with the therapist. She also came to me with similar set of questions, which she wanted to get coaching with me on that. So part of life coaching and transformation coaching. And I got to know about that. She's working with therapist after the session. So she mentioned about that, but she never mentioned that what she is getting, getting help on with the therapist. And then I was, I kept thinking, uh, Oh, because I didn't know about that. I don't know if I have crossed that line. Um, you know, and, and that is something uh, which has been on my mind because I just, I just think that it's very important to differentiate your life coaching with the business, what the therapist is doing. And when clients are not informing you, so how do I make sure that this doesn't happen to me again? Because now I'm not working with that client anymore. I want to focus her with the therapist thing. So is it more like I need to ask that question in the strategy session? to pre-qualify them or is it more like getting into the contract so that they don't confuse me with the therapist? 
excuse me for this tickle. Um, great question. One, you absolutely, you absolutely want to have language, including in a disclaimer in your client services agreement, which my template has, the one that's on my site, it lets people know life coaching or whatever kind of coaching you provide is not therapy, yeah. it's not professional services. It's not any of these other things. So that's step one is having the proper language in your contract. Two is in the course of delivering the services. If you learn something particularly where you think that it makes this person either high risk or that they need or require a professional level of support like a therapist, you need to know your boundaries where you refer them on and you say, you know what, <clears throat> this is probably not the type of support that I can provide to you. And you recommend that they get in touch with a professional or a therapist. Coaching is tricky because you can learn a lot about people and be supporting them in different areas of their life. And it can have benefits like therapy does, but it's very different. And you definitely don't want that to be a confusing experience for a client. So if you suspect that, you know, they're suicidal or they're depressive or they've got something really serious going on, they need professional support, probably not life coaching. Yeah. Right? In my case, she was already having the therapist consultations and sessions, but she still uh, reached out to me for additional sessions, you know, whatever she felt comfortable with me or whatever her, her thing was. But then I realized that because I didn't know what <clears throat> was happening on the therapy sessions. And, and I know that we, I never intersected that. Yeah. But I realized that uh, I don't know what the sessions are about in her case. And that's okay. You probably, you probably don't need to know what her private therapy sessions are about. The fact that she's getting therapy is actually a good sign because she can distinguish between professional therapy and life coaching, but you need to spell it out really, really clearly in your contract that your coaching is not therapy, right? It's not any of these other things and have limitations of liability around that along with your disclaimer. So um, <clears throat> very good point. Make sure that it's covered in your contract and then to the extent someone raises an issue, especially if it involves risk to another human or harm to themselves, then you're also subject to reporting requirements by state where you either need to report that to authorities. Um, you have to be really aware. People in the coaching space need to be aware of what those reporting requirements are. Usually it's harm to children, harm to elders, harm to another human or threats to themselves, especially if they're suicidal, depressive, etc. So you have to be very on top of reporting requirements. And then also just very open where if it seems that they need professional support and you decide that they're not a good fit for your services, that you, that you close those services and you, you know, recommend that they um, seek a referral. Yeah, no, referral. In my case, yeah, she was already having the therapy session. So I was, that, that's, that's okay. But I was like, okay, in the future, I need to be value of that, that whoever is coming to me who already is going through therapy mm -hmm. sessions, I can just say, you know what, just, first focus on that and let's just work you know later on I don't want to uh, get somebody who is in the therapy sessions yes and, that, and you can have that policy as well totally Dr. Okay. Catherine and, um, I come across some of that as well because mm -hmm. uh, I do health coaching and then there's you know the the other side of the, the licensed professions uh, I do have that in my like I have an intake <clears throat> questionnaire mm -hmm. that asks if they're seeing anybody else so that that gives me a little flag to ask them and say you know I, I need not ask them so much but just let them know like this is just going to be supportive and mm -hmm. you want to check with that practitioner to make sure that this is right for you at this time that's right, right. So, that's right so, so in that way, you're not losing the client, you're not turning them away, and also you're not disappointing them because if they're seeking your help, that means they feel that they, they need the additional support. But it's always a good idea for the, the licensed doctor or therapist to know that their mm -hmm. client is, is seeking additional support in this way. Um, they, can, they can kind of, you can work sort of collaboratively rather mm -hmm. than, than the work, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah. So, so, yeah. so if, if you can maybe ask in your intake form if that allows you to ask that you know are you are you seeking any other um work with any any other professional in this way and if you are then just inform the other person <clears throat> correct, correct yeah okay that's great thank you um yeah because yeah. most therapists don't mind that their clients or most doctors don't mind that their clients work with the coach they actually invite that but we, they just want to know so that they also can do their job better for their client. 
the, the ultimate goal is for the client to feel better. Yeah. So that's right. most, most doctors want that. Yeah. Great point. All right. Good questions. You guys, there's not anything else. If we've been going an hour and 40 minutes, I'm probably going to wrap up today. That was awesome. We had a lot of new people and great questions, which I loved. Um, so, but you're also welcome to reach out via email or show up next week. Okay. All right. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful week. Good to connect with you. Bye Malika. Bye James. Bye Kathy. Good to see you. Dr. Catherine. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Take care.